offerings for workshops the rest of the semester. We're gonna get started soon on programming for the spring. So if you have suggestions of things that you'd like to see, there's a um, contact information on that website where you can reach out and let us know what type of workshops you would be interested in. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Jordan. Hey, hello, thank you, Lindsay. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share here. <clears throat> okay, um, I don't see anybody's video anymore. So if you could just give me a quick audible um, confirmation that you're seeing my screen. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, as Lindsay said, my name is Jordan Sly. I'm gonna do sort of the first part here. I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about some, uh, some background on DH and digital humanities and give a little bit of a primer on that. Um, and uh, do a quick tour of some projects to kind of help give a little bit of um, uh, inspiration, hopefully, for uh, some directions in digital humanities. And then Raf is going to go through the like difficult technical part. <laughs> He's going to show uh, a lot more of the nuts and bolts of how these projects come together, what it looks like to use data in the humanities, um, and to kind of go through how they did that for some of these projects, um, especially the ones that he's worked on um, as well. So he'll be able to explain those in more detail. Um, and uh, so that's our, our basic outline here. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, so as I said, this is a very quick overview of the digital humanities. And it's difficult because digital humanities doesn't have just one solid definition. Looking at this Twitter account, for example, the digital humanities or defining DH, we can see this quite plainly. This account tweets quotes from DH literature where the authors define their definition of DH. As you can imagine, they have a lot of tweets, but and the page is mostly defunct now, but the point is that uh, many of the definitions, uh, there are as many definitions of DH as there are practitioners. Um, as a methodology, however, Looking at DH as a confluence of traditional humanities methods, combining them with computational technology and understanding and explicating the value added by this approach is a serviceable working conception. The aim with DH is to enhance a project through the use of digital tools in a way that can't be done with traditional methods. It's important to note that there are many hundreds, if not more, uh, DH projects being currently worked on. So defining a specific notion is really next to impossible given the varied ways that projects have expanded and iterated on these definitions. Many projects fall within a, class of, a classical conception of the humanities and focus on textual analysis or historical analysis in multiple formats through geographical data, historical data, such as inventories or other snapshots of the past, musical information, video, sound, etc. The list goes on. DH allows humanists to use the expanded sense of text, documentation, and evidence to put into a new context um, all of these components for better, deeper analysis and, more importantly, discovery. All of this is to say we'll be giving some examples to show that there is no really no real one universal digital humanities, um, and each version of it really kind of is based on the uh, core discipline that the scholar is working from, um, and then also the level of technology that they need in order to best sort of exemplify this. So, for example, digital history will, despite the use of its uh, of, of sort of digital technologies, will still be focused on explaining facets of history in ways similar to traditional methods often though only at a sort of grander scale. Um, with the inclusion of higher order and at a grander scale with the inclusion of higher order analysis and visualization, the important shift here becomes the method of presentation. As I'll show with Ruth and Sebastian Annert's uh, Marian, uh, Marian Letters Project and the Six Degrees of Francis Bacon Project, often DH gives visibility to data that might otherwise be hidden. I found this in my own project on the, res on the Recusant print network. My aim was to make immediate data that can otherwise be obscured through its normal format. The remediation is typically the point of digital humanities to remove barriers of traditional scholarship and to allow greater visibility, the, to allow greater vi visibility and the collocation of data and the better ability to demonstrate change over time in a compelling way, or to allow further and deeper interaction with material in a way not possible with traditional scholarship. An example of this is found in the Early Modern Soundscapes project that we're going to be looking at shortly, where sound, manuscripts, and modern transcription bring music from this period to life in ways traditional, uh, that a traditional monograph, for example, cannot. 
this is also where experiments w- experiments with augmented reality can add excitement, especially for students, as they can see a world past the the world of the past forming around them in their current space with a sort of ghostly spatial overlap. These projects use traditional methods and the varied data available to them, such as handwritten music scores, geographic data, letters, newspapers, and more, and remix it into a new and more engaging format, showing as opposed to telling in, in most ways. Other digital humanists, however, uh, for other digi- digital humanists, however, the digital is the main focus in a nearly mirrored way. So researchers like Matthew Kirschenbaum and his students here at UMD focus on born digital technologies and the creation of digital media and digital media archaeology. For them, the idea is to look with a humanist lens towards the developed technologies and work to understand the societal factors of its creation and the epistemological framework for its existence, success, or failure among other things, of course. Digital humanities has been called the quote, next big thing for a very long time. That particular quote comes from the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, in 2009, but it's a thing that's often also quite misunderstood by traditional scholars who either look at DH as frivolous or unserious or unnecessary, or conversely as the savior of the humanities and the way forward towards as is usually the problem, funding. Matthew Gold, for example, who has been a leading voice in DH uh, of of a certain generation, um, has been editing and contributing to an ongoing series of essays um, and project descriptions called The Debates in the Digital Humanities since about 2012, beginning with his foundational essay, which was originally published in 2010, uh, and and until the most recent edition, uh, which is 2019, I think, matters of definition and purpose have been consistently present in this series. So they've been working out these issues of what is the digital humanities um, this whole time. At the heart of much of this debate is the notion of at what point is new media part of the humanities? In other words, to traditional humanities departments, how recent is too recent and how digital is too digital to matter. Additionally, as most DH projects require a hefty order of coding skills and often a team of DH tech experts, tech experts At what point does DH lose its footing in the scholarly mission of traditional humanities departments and become little more than a tech venture? It's also worth mentioning that DH is not simply a product of the 2000s. The Association for Computers and the Humanities was founded back in 1978, and even some of the current projects um, that are currently talked about and, and ongoing have their conception back in the 90s. So this is not a hot new trend but an evolving area of humanistic practice with a vast body of research behind it. A founding voice in digital humanity scholarship is Franco Moretti, whose papers analyzing uh, large text data sets of text uh, culled and curated from digitized 19th century material give us the notion of distance reading, for example. Distance reading, reading is essentially the ability to see phrases, words, and constructions across an author's text in corporea. In other words, to zoom out from the individual word, the individual page, the individual book, the individual author, and so on, and to see how individual words pair with others across a spectrum. With this ability to zoom out, we can see sentiment and other themes in a larger way than is possible by an individual scholar. As Joanna Drucker points out in her essay, Humanistic Theory and Digital Scholarship, it is still an ongoing question as to whether digital humanities are doing anything particularly new or simply rephrasing existing scholarship with newer language. But the new language is important and it's an important evolution in the new scholarship. In other words, the novelty comes from the advances that are represented by this new language. Of additional importance, many of the terms and techniques come from the world of big data and therefore reflect a new scope and a scale for humanistic practice. A major early tool, and one with a very low barrier to entry, is the Google Books Ngram Viewer. This tool allows some very basic but insightful text analysis and has been the inspiration for many digital humanities projects in their early forms. Google Books Ngram's Google Books Ngram allows users to formulate a search within Google Books, which is a huge data set, not fully comprehensive, but a very interesting body of literature, um, and view the recurrence of a phrase over time. In this very basic example, we can see the printed instances. Again, it's a digitized corpus of of things that are uh, usually printed. We can see the term utopia and where it has peaks and valleys from its first uses to more modern uses. Again, first uses is in uh, quotes there. 
Additionally, if we could do a search for Jane Austen, uh, we can see sort of some interesting things that you know kind of correlate with our knowledge of Jane Austen. So uh, to see here, we can see the, the, her relative references across uh, her printed literature to give some basic insights. Uh, these are the basic sort of starting points that can enhance traditional scholarship. And as I mentioned, are often the beginning stages of more developed and interesting projects. So this just gives a kind of visualization for a term paper or something. I mean, it's not terribly exciting, but it does give um, a sort of starting point into digital humanities. Another source of nearly limitless data um, that is with some effort mineable without a team of dedicated DHers is Twitter. Many projects looking at general sentiment analysis, linguistic analysis, topic coverage, and more have focused on Twitter as a stand-in for other textual sources. This data can give researchers an immediate view of an event, such as the Black Lives Matter marches and movements, political events around the world, or understand online communities. This data is often paired with other av available data, such as mapping data and GIS. So many available DH package programs uh, can read latitude and longitude data, for example. Um, and using the Google Maps API is actually quite easy. So like with the Ngram viewer, the ease of entry allows some creativity um, and the basic development of projects. My own interest in digital humanities stemmed from a conference on bibliometrics, of all things. Um, Bibliometrics is essentially the cit is citation analysis and research data mining within the world of journal impact factors, tenure competition, and research impact analysis. It's, it's a bit dry. Um, and in this conference, I was more or less introduced to the notions of network analysis, another popular format for digital humanities. At a very basic level, network analysis weighs the connective fibers between indicated elements and allows the researcher to understand the importance of individual nodes in relationship to others based on the weight of their edges. Um, so in most constructions of this, nodes are represented as circles and edges as lines, uh, and the weight of the connection is then usually represented by the size of the nodes and the lines based on the frequency of, of the sort of collocation in the data. Simple analysis uh, and visualization software such as Gelfi and Tableau can be used to create basic visual visualizations like these. Um, and these are sort of basic network analysis tools. Importantly, however, like with the Google tools, this is an entry point and not typically the end goal of a project. Big bigger projects usually funded have far more advanced tools which allow for predictive modeling and dynamic visualization accounting for new data such as tweets or new formulations of existing data such as the Six Degrees of Francis Bacon project, which I'll show here in a second. Ultimately, the success of a project rests on both its theoretical framework, the use of digital tools as an integral part of the conceptual process, and the ability to iterate and adapt to more data and dimensions as applicable. Most projects or many projects stall out, as with my own, frankly, when the uh, limitations outweigh the possibilities. Many of my colleagues have found similar problems uh, as they reach a point where they're no longer able to handle the, the level of work on their own, the volume and the technical capabilities, et cetera. Uh, for very few digital humanists, you know, up a project, a, a singular project is their only job. Therefore, upkeep and progress is often very difficult. Many projects end up relying on crowdsourcing for translations, um, amongst other things. And this can be time consuming in its own right and can have mixed results, as you can imagine. Uh, so Raph will give a lot more detail about the nature of data and humanities and the practical applications needed to actually do DH. Um, and I've tried to give something of a primer on the topic, but there isn't a way to do justice on the vast variety of projects in the DH field. My bias uh, is clear through this is towards history and literature projects because uh, I'm a historian, but there are projects to explore in nearly every humanities field. Um, so what I wanna do next with that is to show some of these projects, a, a little snapshot of some projects um, that are utilizing some of the tools that we've been discussing, just kind of show off what they are um, and work through them a little bit. Um, but you know, with a lot of these, you can't do a, a whole lot of work. I just kind of want to show you some, some things to look at. Um, here's a quick uh, snapshot of some literature to get started in um, DH if you're interested. And I can share this as, uh, I'll share all the slides. Um, uh, when this is over, but um, uh, that's where you can find some of that. So here's a small smattering of some of the um, 
uh, types of pro some of the projects. These are some big projects. A lot of them, a couple of them are associated with UMD. Uh, so I wanted to pull those out specifically, but I mentioned six degrees of Francis Bacon a couple of times. So I'm going to click on that. And since I've left Google Slides, can is are people seeing the um, presentation showing up or the uh, the project showing up? Yes. There? Okay. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the Six Degrees of Francis Bacon project. This is, you know, it's not it's not the first digital humanities project or anything like this, but it's one of the first to get a lot of notoriety uh, within the um, the history field, at least within the field that I'm most familiar with in early modern history. Um, there have been others, of course, but this is um, one of the early projects that got some traction. Um, it, what it does is it's, it's a network analysis project, um, and it shows the connections between uh, various people to our boy Francis Bacon. Um, and this is an interesting project as it smatters out through literature networks, uh, both formal and informal. So it's sort of letters and mentions um, in, in actually quite a social media way. Uh, so if Thomas Hobbes uh, mentions Francis Bacon in a letter, for example, then that's a connection. But if he mentions it to someone else, one of these other nodes along the way, then that's a sort of a looser connection and, and so on and so forth. So you can see all of the, the strength of some of these edges being darker colors and some lighter, um, and then the, the real um, hubs here. So, um, you know, and these are the really important people uh, by and large. But what you can do is if we, we can add a person. So I'm going to add someone that I work with, I mean, a figure that I work with. I don't know him personally because he's been dead for a while. Um, but um, I'll add in my friend Samuel Moreland, for example. And what you can do here um, is if we dive into an example, now we see the connective tissue between just these two people, and we can start to kind of work through how they know each other. So for Sammy Moreland, for example, did not know Sir Walter Raleigh or Queen Elizabeth or Robert Cecil, but he did, um, he was knighted by King Charles. He likely knew Samuel Pepys, definitely knew John Thurlow, uh, and I'm sure I'm uh, not sure if he knew Thomas Hobbes, but he definitely knew John Milton, for example, who's another one of these nodes, most surely. So what that does is as a researcher, that allows us to go in um, to a particular person and work through their connections. And if I go to Samuel Moreland's node, um, it'll also give me more information about his network more broadly and so on and so forth. You can also take this out of this uh, network and link out to their biographical information through um, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, for example. And it's a good way to build a project if you're sort of stuck. So it's an interesting conceptual project. And I mentioned what makes one of the elements of this sort of interesting um, at a DH level or sort of a, at a programmatic level is the fact that it's dynamic. So there is a, a data set in here, but it is ever changing as new networks are added, new connections and things are added in. That predictive element, the thing that allows me to make the two connections between different people, that predictive element um, is one of the real challenges there of connecting up a vast uh, variety of data. If we go, well, sort of stalled out a little bit here. My computer is whirling. You can look at a lot of the, you know, the, the team behind it, but I think you'll, one of the most important things to note is how many people, <laughs> how many different uh, groups are involved um, in, in this um, project, you know, at varying levels, but there are funding agencies and sponsorships and things making the programming side. Um, you can see if you go through their list here, I mean, they have dedicated programmers and, and so on and so forth. Um, um, and they've gotten, you know, a lot of news and everything here. Um, that's a little bit different than some other projects where there's maybe one or two people associated. Um, another example is something like, this is a simpler example, but here's the spread of slavery um, in the US here from 1790 to 1860. Um, and what you have here is a, you know, a pretty basic um, uh, breakdown of census data. And what this allows you to do is as you pull um, the, um, the slider here, it changes the nature of what the country looks like and the rates of slavery and so on and so forth. So you can see just in a, in a short amount of time, you know, how things change in that period of time, uh, both in the conception of the, of the states and then as it moves forward. So um, 
you know, you can you can um, adjust a lot of these here too. So we can say um, we can adjust a lot of these different factors. And again, this is just census information data, you know, remixed in a different way um, that allows it to kind of visualize and, and make more interesting um, what everybody's looking at when they're looking at your paper and your data. Um, Women Writers Project, I have to just kind of skip through a bit briefly because it's uh, a subscription-based project, uh, but it does have interesting elements here and it is worth kind of poking around um, in their uh, publications and things. Most of these projects will have uh, publications associated with them. Um, so it is worth you know, taking a look through um, their publications to see what, what they're writing about for their projects. Um, if we go to the Shelley Godwin archive, this is a UMD affiliated project and one that Raf is uh, a part of as well. So he can there he is, uh, talk in more detail about all of this, of course. But you know that you have one of the main uses for historical you know, digital history and, and digital literature studies and, and digital humanities is essentially digitizing things that are difficult to, to view otherwise. And so um, you, know, you have even just in the, the basic presentation of um, primary sources of, of, you know, sort of facsimile versions of this. This is very valuable just in and of itself for historians, um, especially at times like this where we can't travel. Uh, so being able to actually see things that we can't see um, is important. And the sort of transcription element of this too, as you can see here, being a little bit slow. So I'm worried it's gonna stall out. Um, I had a catastrophic crash yesterday. So there we go. And the transcription part being, of course, the most important here, right? So it makes readable this, which is challenging to say the least, um, to read. So the sort of visualizing the primary sources and things um, is, is a very interesting part of all of this. And I mentioned the Protestant Letter Network here too. Um, this is just a simple, I wanted to kind of show a drier example um, in the scholarship, but this is a um, very important paper in digital humanities. And you can see it looks very similar to the Francis Bacon project, but it's static. Um, and my own project is static like this as well. And I think that's one of the weaknesses of some of these things and some of the difficulties that a lot of us have where we kind of reach a stalling point where we can present the data, um, but making the, the sort of hard coding behind it uh, is, is a lot more difficult. Um, I'm going to just briefly go into this, but actually uh, Raf will go into more detail about this and, and it's probably better for him to talk about it anyway. Um, um, in fact, the link that I put here is the wrong one. So we'll probably just have Raf talk about it if that's okay, Raf. Um, but in, I mentioned uh, during the other part of the talk, the, um, uh, the idea of kind of combining uh, primary sources and then remediating them and making them available in a different way. This is a good example of that project where now taking um, you know, extant sources and kind of pushing them into a way where they're more interactive and more interesting in a different way, create something that you cannot do in a traditional format. So in all of these projects, um, what you have is something that is not impossible to represent in traditional humanities, but difficult and are there are good examples here of the benefits of DH in a non-superfluous way, right? There are things here, again, that you, you cannot do otherwise. So this allows you to, these formats allow you to do something that you couldn't do otherwise, or would have to do over, you know, an entire career showing each breakdown of this census data, for example. Um, you know, if you were to just write about every part of this, um, you know, you would have to do it in smaller increments and the changes would have to be, you know, discussed as opposed to shown. Um, and so it kind of moves you past some elements of scholarship and allows you to kind of dig into other aspects that may be more interesting. Again, this is something that I found in my own research was that, you know, once I kind of put everything out on the table, I mean, it, it was sort of akin to spreading a bunch of cards out on the table. I could see themes and networks that, I, that can't be seen as easily through the traditional presentation of the data, which is in archival folders, right? So in those things, in those archival folders, it's hidden, stored away, and by a sort of making them visible in a more um, uh, uh, you know, orientable fashion, I was able to kind of see new connections that weren't talked about before. So those are some of the benefits and some of the general methods um, of digital humanities. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, and it's also, let's see, how do I? 
it's also unnerving to talk to nobody. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Raf to go on to the next section. Thank you, Jordan. Okay. I'm going to sort of continue Jordan's overview of uh, digital humanities work and uh, focus um, a little bit more on methodologies uh, rather than projects um, and, you know, branch out to specific projects and tools and uh, that, that are uh, associated with uh, certain methodologies. Um, digital humanities, as Jordan explained, is complicated. So uh, even though, you know, I had a chance to participate in a number of uh, different types of digital humanities, you know, I certainly have a, a, a bias when it comes to like the things that I know more or less or the kind of research that I tend to do. So I'll do my best to give sort of an overview uh, of some methodologies that I think are um, important and, and relevant in the field. Um, I want to start from talking about what is data in the humanities because um, essentially before we are able to do uh, any kind of uh, operations with computers on you know, the, the subject of study of, of the humanities, we need to make sure that computers can actually operate with them. Um, and there is a fair bit of literature that discusses this. Um, I think uh, a lot of the output about this topic, what is that in the humanities, was probably discussed between 10, 15 years ago. Um, but uh, it has also, you know, a long uh, history anyway. I'm just talking about sort of volume here. And it continues as, you know, our use of computers and shape of data um, uh, changes and goes forward. Uh, but I certainly like to look back at this paper by um, Julia Flanders, who's a research professor at Northeastern um, University, um, who uh, sort of defines data as a state in which information is subjected to the strict codification of the measurable. Um, essentially, what she's suggesting here is that as soon as we start working with a cultural object, that is our object of investigation as humanists, uh, if we want to make it into data, so that computers can use it, uh, it has to be um, codified in a way that makes it measurable. And going through this operation, uh, we leave our mark in a way and on the cultural object that we're trying to, uh, to model. Um, and, and that's an important fact um, that I'll return to in a minute. And once you have your objects uh, in a shape that, that can be uh, measured, uh, then you can do something with it. Um, so her quote continue, continues, um, I'm actually going to read it from the beginning. Uh, data is a state in which information is subjected to the strict codification of the measurable and in which a further numerical, statistical, quantificatory activity upon the information is thereby made possible. So essentially, once you can measure it, you can, you can count it, uh, you can, you can uh, quantify it, you can transform it, you can start doing operations with it. And that's what allows you to you know, um, run computational, an computational analyses on um, um, data, uh, of, on humanities data, you can build archives, you can build sort of dynamic online resources, or you, know, you can derive uh, more sort of static results that you can present in multiple ways. But before you achieve those, you need to, to have you know, the cultural object rendered as data. And in order to do that, um, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you, you end up taking important decisions about how you're going to represent something. Uh, and that um, act itself um, has been object of study. Uh, and uh, Willem McCarthy um, wrote an entire uh, book about this idea, uh, in particular, the concept of uh, modeling, uh, because as we are creating a digital representation of a culture object that we study, uh, we are, um, you know, constructing a model. Um, it's it's a surrogate that is not the object itself. Um, it is, you know, a representation um, of it. Uh, and uh, it's a McCarthy says that it's an attempt to capture the dynamic experiential uh, experiential aspects uh, of a phenomenon, uh, which is somewhat you know uh, unattainable because they're dynamic and experiential, right? So it can only be an attempt. Um, and oftentimes, if we know what we're going to do with that model, uh, it means that we're created for a specific purpose of study. So the same cultural object may be represented as data in very different ways, depending on what your final end goal is. Um, for example, with a literary 
text and I'll go through this again, but uh, a piece of literature, we could represent it as just words in order to uh, make it simple for uh, algorithms to uh, count those words and give us important statistics, uh, not important, but uh, interesting statistics about use certain words, etc. But if we want, for example, to build uh, uh, a digital publication for that text, something that is sort of meant to be consumed by humans uh, through um, uh, hypertext and the web, then we will be modeling that text in very different ways and we will be potentially adding extra information that is useful for human consumption, etc. cetera. Um, so another sort of uh, uh, postulate of this idea is that models conceal when they reveal. This is sort of a consequence of the fact that you are creating a model for, for one or more purposes, um, which means that you will inevitably leave something out. Um, and, uh, and that's important both for sort of, un, uh, you know, understanding why something may be uh, left out and sort of question that uh, from a critical perspective, like why are you modeling something versus another or leaving certain aspects out, uh, but also maybe revealing in the sense that uh, you may find the model that you've created inadequate and through that failure, you go back uh, heuristically to the modeling process again, which is kind of what the main point of um, William McCarthy is to uh, explain why it's useful to, to focus on modeling as, a, as an activity in, in the digital humanities. Um, okay, so there are uh, a number of um, types uh, of data in the humanities, which kind of map with, uh, you know, types of data that uh, computers understand. Um, and just to name a few, you know, you can have uh, linear data, which is usually represented as sort of a sequence of things, and text is definitely one of those. You have sort of a sequence of characters. Um, therefore, when you do operations on them, you can rely on the fact that it's uh, uh, organized um, linearly. Um, you can have structured data, which means that uh, you are imposing, um, you know, specific relationships between, uh, um, you know, objects that you are representing. Uh, and one typical one is a um, relational database, which is made of a tables of it that are connected to each other. Uh, or also, you know, that the network that Jordan was uh, showing earlier, um, the network itself is, you know, talking about specific objects and organizes them in a structure that in this case is a graph, right? Where you have these nodes connected by ed edges. Uh, and occasionally you may have semi-structured um, data where um, uh, there is sort of a, a, a less um, strict codification um, of the measurable to, <laughs> to quote Flanders again, but it's, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's connected with, um, um, for example, in, in, in linear text, uh, you can uh, still sort of have that um, linearity to rely on, but you can then uh, use some uh, tags or, or remarks that computer will recognize to indicate what certain portions of that linear text is. So a typical example is something like HTML, um, where you are dealing with sort of a linear textual document, but there is some structure um, scattered across that allows you to then sort of publish it through the browser. Um, and then you have binary data, which is essentially uh, that kind of direct instructions to uh, the computer. Um, and uh, this will be things like images and audio signals and videos. Um, and, and other sort of assets uh, like that, as well as computer code once it gets uh, compiled in a way that a computer can understand it. So this is a, an oversimplification, but I just want to give you an idea of what it means to manipulating data that is you know, organized in those different types of things. Usually that is done through code, uh, which is a set of instructions that are given to a computer in order to process the data. So typically there will be some sort of input, it goes through a transformation of some sort, and then you get um, some output um, that you can pass on to more code, or maybe that's the end, the product, et cetera. It's sort of circular. So um, this code is typically written by people um, and uh, it can get structured into specific resources. So you may, I may be talking uh, in the next, uh, for the next few slides about uh, code libraries, for example. So that's, um, you know, essentially a tool um, made of code that allows you to do certain operations. Uh, and you can rely on um, 
to, um, to use it to uh, manipulate data in certain ways. And typically, these code libraries will switch programming interface or API, which allows you to functions that the libraries define. And you can do that e either by writing more code, so you can use these APIs programmatically, um, or perhaps there is a, a graphical user interface that is built on top of that API that allows you to you know, interact with um, the data and uh, run operations on it by clicking on buttons and you know, using forms and things like that. But once uh, you are uh, done clicking on that button, some code gets executed in order to um, manipulate the data and give you back a result, right? Um, so that's kind of in a, in a nutshell, very briefly, um, how uh, sort of you know how we work with data in the in the humanities. But in fact, you know, just in, in general in the computers, it's it's a simplification. But I've sort of tried to highlight um, typical types of data and operations that that are that can be done with uh, um, humanities uh, within the humanities. Uh, and now I'm going to focus on sort of looking at different types of, of, of methods. And I want to uh, sort of uh, point out uh, this um, blog post and there's also a very interesting video by uh, Miriam Posner uh, called How Do They Make That? That sort of takes exactly this approach of like looking at existing projects and sort of reverse engineer them to some extent and figure out what data they were using, what kind of code um, they were using in order to obtain the, uh, the, the research goal. Um, and uh, I also wanted to emphasize you know what Jordan already mentioned that is like kind of that we can here uh, uh, meaning that you know as I you know consider that there is certainly a lot that you can learn on your own and there's a lot that you can achieve on your own um, through self-study and you know, figuring out some of these tools work etc um, in, in order to create something that, um, that, that it's a more fully fledged research project, it is very likely that, you know, that will have to be some sort of um, collaborative um, effort. So keep that in mind as we go through apologies so that you don't think that you need to know all of this stuff to the Jolly Um One thing is certain though, it's very good to know to uh, try and understand how um, so that when you're collaborating with others, uh, um, you know what they're talking about, uh, how we should proceed, even though you may not be the person who ends up writing code. And I also wanted to point out uh, this project uh, by um, Daria, which is a digital humanities European association uh, called Open Methods, where, you know, it's a website where you can explore the European project, um, but it's another place where you can get a sense of what kind of um, operations you can do with humanities. And um, I will be going this way. Okay. So I wanted to start by talking about uh, and collections. Um, so this is, you know, a For sort of entry digital force and sort of archival work, uh, you're digitizing some documents. You are essentially, you know, creating. Um, one of the things that you could you could do is organize this collection and actually uh, publish it online as a companion to your uh, more analog study, for example. Um, and that is a way to uh, generate. more access as well. It may not have found its way into um, your, uh, 
your article or sort of your conclusions. It doesn't mean that it's not uh, valuable, right? But it may not be as visible. So this is, you know, web publication in particular is one of the ways of making some of our research uh, uh, be more visible and accessible, like, like Jordan was saying. So maybe work uh, um, is that um, and you can use this to create a collection of sources, uh, for example, a facsimile of primary sources or catalogs where you are sort of talking about specific objects that exist in the real world and you're adding more information about them. Um, and it's typically then published on the web with uh, features that make it possible to search through this collection to browse it. Uh, and it will uh, typically have, you know, a taxonomy or tags, other sort of finding aids to go through uh, the collection and how you organize, you have organized it. Uh, in order to create something like this, uh, typically, especially if you're creating a collection from resources, you will have to digitize them somehow. Maybe documents, you may be scanning them if it's objects and, and you're able to photograph them, you can do that. Or maybe someone else has done it already, but you are working with the, those digitizations that others have created, right? You need to have something to collect, essentially. And then you will be adding extra metadata, uh, such as which is information about the objects uh, in the collection. Uh, and then you can rely on, on certain tools to publish this data. Uh, and one uh, tool that is used often in digital humanities is called uh, Omeka, uh, which allows you to enter all this information uh, via forms, for example. And here, this is a screenshot, or not a screenshot, but rather a, a schema, a diagram, a, a, a representation of the uh, database of um, Omeka. And so each one of these is, uh, is, is tables and you can see that, um, you know, th there is a, a table of items that have certain properties such as an ID, uh, whether they belong in a collection, is it public? Um, then there are like, there's like a list of item types and there is a table of collections. Um, uh, and then all of these are coordinated um, so that you know one type, you know, one item has an item type and it a collection, this kind of stuff that then al allows the computer to um, um, uh, you know build the kind of uh, presentational offer um, to our users as well as reformation that, that you want to capture. Um, so Omeka is one of these tools that allows you to do this work through a graphical user interface. You can essentially fill up forms, but you can also build your own software, for example, uh, Postgres uh, SQL. And SQL is the, uh, is a, the sort of the language that allows you to manipulate um, one of the main languages that allows you to sort of tap their yeah, data. Um, so a little bit more about uh, Omeka. Um, but specifically thinking about how to build a website on top of that representation. Um, you know, Omeka is popular because it comes with existing uh, user interface concepts and themes, so it's easy to build a site. Um, uh, but if you want to build your own, then that requires you to write code to retrieve the data from the database and create web pages. And one popular application for doing so, uh, for example, among many, many others, is Django, uh, which comes with great database management built in and an accessible API that allows you to code a web website um, fairly quickly. And it's popular, so there are a lot of uh, teaching resources for learning how to build uh, a project in Django. Uh, Omeka is more entry level because it comes with all that support to help you build things. But once you want to start creating something that is more unique and better tailored to your needs, then you, that's when you have to start writing code or working with someone who can. So I wanted to show you what Omeka looks like. Um, and it, it's a free tool, um, but you will have to host it yourself. Uh, it's money. Uh, they offer a plan, which also costs money. Um, but you can try it out uh, for free. Um, so I, I just want to show you what it looks like by creating a collection for my month. 
So here is Omega.net, and I have you know um, a site that I've created through their uh, free um, trial. If I go and manage the site, uh, here you can see that, and you know, a full installation of Omega will give you even more options than this. But essentially, what we want to work with is the three main tables um, of the database. You can have items, you can have collections, and item types. Um, so. Let's start with a collection. I've already created, no, okay, I'll create a collection. And we'll, you know, I'm operating on the database right now, but I'm essentially doing it through forms. So I'm gonna give you the title, I'm gonna call it my mugs. Uh, and you can write a lot more information, topic, description, creator, etc. cetera. And um, Omeka is re uh, relying on something called the Dublin Core, which is, is a, a very simple set of metadata elements that can be understood by other, other applications as well. So they're trying to, to be reusable, right? Um, so I'm gonna add this public collection. And now that I've made it public, the code here already knows how to also visualize uh, that uh, the collection. So this is not a part of the site that will be visible to my users. This is essentially a tool that Omeka provides to build uh, and populate the database. Then I'm going to um, add an item. Uh, I've already added one. Um, so I'm going to add another. Um, I'm going to give you the title. Uh, I'm going to call it the Guggenheim. I'm going to say that, uh, so see how item type here lets me select from a list is because there is a table of item types. It comes already pre-populated with a lot of interesting things, including the fact that I'm talking about, say, a physical object, but you can add your own concept. Um, so it can be quite flexible. Uh, and I'm going to add um, an image of it. And then I'm gonna add it to a collection. Again, there's a drop down, drop down menu here because I'm connecting it to a different table in the database. Add item. It's uploading the image, so let me take a second. But next I'm going to go back to the collection and just um, switch over to the public part of the site, uh, um, users will be able to look at the collection and, and explore it and see the information that I've added about these different items. Since that's taking a while, I'm gonna go back to collections. You can see them both here. Um, I forget how to go to the public part of the site. I think I just click on it. <laughs> View public page. Okay. All right. So you know, it comes with a very basic site, but you can change this and it comes with a lot of themes that you can get. You can really sort of make it your own. And here I'm just seeing basic information about my collection, which I haven't really populated, but then eventually also like lists uh, the items um, in it. Um, I forgot to attach the other one, but anyway, then you can add, you can um, access more information about each item. And so this becomes a way for uh, your users to explore your collection. And it comes with its own, you know, search facility, et cetera. So if you have a large corpus and you have the patients to put it together, these, you, you are essentially building a resource that can be used for further research or to support research that you have published elsewhere, such as in an article. Okay, moving on. Um, the other type of uh, methodology that I want to talk about uh, is digital scholarly um, editions. Um, this is you know, one of the fields I spent most time in um, and uh, essentially has to, it focuses on um, textual data, um, which often comes from physical objects, uh, which could be things like manuscripts or uh, printed documents, you know, um, 
um, so the scholarly editions traditionally are created for print and it's done by sort of focusing on a specific work or collection of works and looking at um, their um, history. Uh, you know, look at the manuscript when they were first drafted, uh, then at their sort of first print and how they got disseminated and new editions came out, etc. And as a scholar, you do um, sort of a work of um, understanding this history and uh, potentially identifying differences that exist among all the different sources um, that are extant uh, for this work. And then you create a new book that you know publishes uh, the text according to how you view it based on your historical research, as well as a bunch of extra information about what you found out when you went digging into the archive. Um, once you target um, the digital medium as a way of publishing all that information, uh, you have a greater possibilities than uh, the ones provided by a regular book to show your users uh, the, the work that you've done and sort of teach them more about the history of the specific text that you've been working with. Um, and the typical technology for doing this kind of work is um, a form of semi-structured uh, data, uh, uh, in particular, descriptive markup. So if you've ever seen uh, an HTML document, which is you know, what makes web pages essentially, you might have seen this kind of coding with angle brackets. You know, oftentimes uh, people will associate like this um, kind of uh, image with the idea of coding itself. Um, um, but essentially what is happening here is that we're telling the, com the computer um, how to deal with uh, specific portions of text and HTML and, other, and even things like Microsoft Word will rely on things like this to say, show this in italics or organize this in a paragraph. With descriptive markup, you're essentially doing the same thing, but you're telling the computer what a portion of text is. So you're taking a much more um, semantic approach to that kind of representation, which allows you to, um, to then do further operations uh, on it, both analytical, but primarily in the case of the Joe Scar editions um, related to, uh, to publication and scholarly communication. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by uh, of that by by that uh, by looking at the Charlie Govan archive, which Jordan mentioned before. Um, so one of the first things that we did was to um, um, you know digitize facsimile images of the Frankenstein manuscript written by uh, Mary Shelley, of course, and uh, provide a transcription. Um, and we provided this transcription in a way that actually captures what's called the mise en page of the text, that is how the text has been laid on a specific page. Um, and uh, we took care of um, adding through tags uh, information about things like what was added, what was deleted, um, where was it added, um, and in particular, by whom, because there is clear evidence on the manuscript that um, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley's husband, uh, intervened on the page. And uh, we used that underlying representation um, to generate multiple views. One is uh, the one that focuses more on the mise en page, uh, often called also sort of a diplomatic uh, rendition that tries to sort of imitate the, the, um, the page so that it becomes essentially kind of a map that lets you understand um, and decode uh, the image better. Uh, in older times, it even had more of a sort of a preservation uh, component to it because it would be more difficult than it is now to represent, to uh, replicate the digital image. Maybe you were looking at it in black and white because you couldn't make it to the archives. So having this kind of diplomatic descriptions was even more essential. Uh, but uh, what, what we've also included in the underlying uh, encoding is, um, an indication of who wrote what. Um, so that allows us to create a view like this, for example, where you can choose to only look at text that was written by Percy Shelley, text that was written by Mary Shelley using an highlight. Uh, and this was particularly relevant in this case because in the past, um, scholars have used uh, the fact that Percy's hand can be identified on the page as an indication of the fact that uh, Percy Shelley is in fact the author of Frankenstein, not Mary Shelley. And we wanted, you know, to, uh, that has been debunked several times, but we wanted to, you know, uh, contribute even further evidence of, of this fact by making it clear, clear through a form of visualization, essentially, that the intervention by Percy Shelley's are essentially copy editing. 
uh, and this is what it looks like, um, um, you know, which is sort of the same image that you that you saw before when I mentioned what's this what descriptive markup is. But you know, essentially, what's on this page gets transcribed here, like with regular letters. But then we rely on these elements or tags in blue to tell the computer, you know, that there is a modification here, mod, made of an addition and a deletion, this kind of stuff. Um, so what does this look like when you actually want to go ahead and do it? Um, so the technology that, uh, the, the, that, that we use, uh, these angle brackets is called XML or, uh, X, uh, uh, wow, I forget, forgetting the acronym now. Uh, it's markup language um, and uh, TEI or the text encoding initiative is a specific grammar uh, that is imposed on top of the more typical uh, sort of XML um, structure that can be anything, anything you want. You can name these tags anything you want, uh, but if you provide a grammar, then you can create a specific flavor of encoding. Uh, and that's what, you know, text encoding is. It's essentially like a grammar that lets you use um, XML in a certain way. So uh, in order to do something like this, you will first need to obtain a digitized version of your text. Uh, it is not too crazy to transcribe it by hand. You know, editors do that for the preparation of print editions all the time. But if you're lucky enough to have a source that is legible by a computer, you may rely on what's called optical character recognition to uh, determine automatically um, what characters are on the page. And then you will have sort of a simple transcription that with minor, with a, that you will have to likely correct a little bit. And then starting from that, you start at adding a markup to model the textual phenomena that are relevant to your um, editorial idea. Uh, and there are a number of tools that can support you uh, doing this. The most commonly used one is the Oxygen XML editor, uh, which is free, but it's fully featured. Uh, it, it has a lot of support for this kind of work. Um, and then an, an alternative that is great for beginners, it's more, a little bit more minimal, but you can still do a lot with it, is using uh, VS Code, which is uh, just a code editor software that is free uh, and open source written, published by uh, Microsoft. Uh, and uh, uh, there's an extension extension to, uh, you know, to uh, connect your file with your XML file with um, a TI schema and it will give you suggestions and will validate your file. Um, there's a GIF of it here, but I was going to show you what that looks like you know, with a live example. So here I have one of the texts from uh, early modern songscapes that Jordan mentioned earlier, um, where we use DI to um, encode various versions of um, songs from from these um, uh, from this book um, by uh, I forget um, I forget who wrote it anyway uh, and. So here we're providing, you know, a bunch of um, sort of contextual information about each song and the source where it comes from. Uh, and then so we provide the text itself. And here we're relying on certain elements to, uh, you know, mark up stanzas and uh, verse structure. Um, and then we're also adding some elements here, like this seg, to indicate where variants exist so that we can connect it with other versions of this text. And just to give you an example, you know, as I'm working with this file, if I start typing an, an element, it will let me know which other elements are available at this specific location in the file as it indicated by the TEI and, and give me like a description of it. Um, and similarly, if I uh, want to, to add, you know, kind of title pieces, uh, I can rely on something called um, like an attribute uh, to provide further information about um, a specific um, tag. This is kind of what it looks like when you when you're doing this work. Uh, but then you have to publish it, right? And uh, publishing it, uh, you know, requires kind of a transformation of your encoding text into a number of possible outputs. You could even just be creating a PDF or an ebook. Uh, but most typically, you end up creating a, an interactive website like the Shelley Goblin Archive. Um, you can do this in a in a number of ways, but two relatively accessible tools are TI Publisher, which is the one featured here that sort of comes with a lot of uh, 
built-in views uh, to um, display text uh, and create search indexes and connect them with images. Um, the catch is that it requires using Exist, which is an XML uh, database. And just like with Omeka, you have to have a server and you know a little bit of knowledge on how to set it up in order to, to publish uh, data. Um, and then uh, another tool, it's called, uh, this is pronounced cetacean, just like the, uh, the, the animal that swims in the ocean or the types of animals that swim in the ocean, cetacean, uh, which is a JavaScript library. I haven't mis mentioned what JavaScript is so far, but it's essentially code and the browser and more, but particularly the browser can run. Um, and that's, you know, every time that you click a button on a web page, there's some JavaScript code that does something. Um, so Citation is a JavaScript library that you can embed into a site with just a few lines of code and it allows you to then have a display um, of the TEI. Uh, and you can always write your own transformations uh, using uh, in particular XML technologies because they know how to work with this kind of data very well. And one is XSLT, which is a fully fledged programming language for um, manipulating XML or XQuery which is also a programming language, but it's usually paired with an XML database and it allows you to you know, retrieve information out of a bunch of XML documents uh, effectively. Um, I also want to briefly mention uh, that you can apply the same concepts to uh, musical texts, in particular music scores. Um, and the music encoding initiative format, uh, it is not the most popular format for representing music for computers, but it is the one that utilizes the same kind of um, concept of descriptive markup um, that works well for scholarly uh, activities. Um, and um, MEI or music Recognition initiative can be then rendered uh, using a tool called Verovio, which generates um, you know, a, a, an image uh, that you can manipulate uh, and it's connected with its underlying representation. So you can do things like, you know, here in this uh, uh, GIF, uh, it's showing, um, you know, different uh, uh, versions of the same document um, that have been encoded in, uh, in, in MEI and Verovio adds some interactivity to let you look different versions, like an original version on the text versus one that is being regularized by an editor. Okay, moving along. Um, another important um, methodology in DH and one of the oldest one is um, uh, so doing some sort of text analysis, also called uh, text mining, uh, or in, especially in computer science circles, uh, information retrieval, which is essentially the discipline that you know, gave us Google. Um, and it typically relies on uh, working on uh, plain text data. So essentially just, you know, strings of, uh, of characters and you build algorithms to re retrieve and uh, infer information. Um, you sort of, you guide the algorithm, but you're sort of letting the machine do, uh, do that work and perhaps even uh, uh, learn based on uh, information that it has previously modeled, which is sort of in a natural, um, how uh, machine learning works in a very sort of simplified way. And the size of the corpus that, uh, that you have really matters in terms of what algorithms can, can do for inferring information or for giving you relevant uh, data because it's often based on you know, st statistic, statistics um, and sort of um, counts of um, probability. Uh, so to, in order to do this kind of work, the kind of data that you need will be some form of digitized uh, content. Um, so if you're interested in a specific type of uh, literature um, or I don't know, newspapers, things like that, you will have to have a, uh, a transcription that is machine readable of this content. So you need to create it somehow. Uh, using optical character recognition is one of the ways of doing that if all that you have is like images. Uh, but there is already a lot out there. For example, Project Gutenberg has been around for decades and they've been collecting very simple representations of um, books, uh, in particular books that are um, out of copyright. But you can apply the same um, technologies and approaches to the entire web because the web is very text-based. Um, and, uh, um, and you can rely on certain 
uh, code, um, often uh, typically this is called web scraping, um, to get a lot of information from the web. And perhaps if you're interested in studying social media, for example, uh, um, social media companies will often provide an API, an application programming interface, to extract data from their um, databases. Uh, and a lot of them will let you do it for free up to a certain extent. And then if, you, if you're doing it too much, then obviously they want to monetize it. But, you know, Facebook, Twitter, anything that is publicly um, available through these platforms can usually be mined. And uh, uh, you know, why would you want these kind of operations? So from a humanities perspective, typically these two uh, test theories. So you have a hunch that something in uh, you know newspapers changing between the uh, 18th and the 19th century something happened uh, in the way in which you know certain news were communicated i'm making something up uh, and then you know you happen to have a lot of access uh, a lot of access to a lot of transcriptions of newspapers from a specific area at that point in time and then you start looking for what you think might have occurred there and see if the if the numbers back you up you know, it, it's a typical uh, use of this kind of analysis, which may or may not result in, you know, a beautiful publication. Maybe you just want to find the truth and then you uh, talk about it in your, uh, in your article and your, uh, when you discuss your methodology. Um, but essentially, it's a matter of, you know, use, relying on these technologies to find patterns, co-occurrences, uh, maybe use this to even get some indications of stylistic marks. Like, is, has this been written by this other or not? And there is an entire branch of study that, called stylometry that focuses exclusively on that. Or maybe you want to learn about language use and grammar. You want computers to learn how to infer grammar rules just out of texts. Um, uh, and then eventually uh, you want to present your findings, uh, perhaps with uh, beautiful interactive visualizations. Um, and there are many ways of doing this kind of work. Um, just to name a few, uh, it is often convenient to rely on what we know about language structures. So you can do something called natural language processing and Python, which is a programming language, um, has a number of tools for doing this work. The NLTK library, the natural language toolkit allows you to uh, very quickly um, load in some texts and use built-in sort of grammar concepts to try and, you know, get the structure of some text or try to infer um, named entities. Like, is this a proper noun? Can I consider it to be of a certain kind? You know, it, 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 it's the first steps into trying to then build more and more complex queries of the text that you're working with. Um, but you can use also a number of just more generic data analysis libraries that can work with more than just text. One that is quite popular with Python is uh, Pandas. Um, and some of these also can be visualization tools. Um, another uh, approach that uh, that has been quite popular is the topic modeling that is essentially um, a statistical model for discovering abstract, uh, abstract topics that occur in a collection of documents. And it's done by figuring out like what kind of words tend to sort of group together, statistically speaking. Um, and one popular tool for doing this work is a Java library called a mallet. And here I have an image by Pip Machines, which is um, an extension to uh, Zotero, which is a um, sort of citation managing software uh, where you can add like PDFs of your articles. And then um, this extension will run uh, topic modeling algorithms on it. Uh, to see, you know, which uh, articles talk about the same thing. And you can see that topics are usually presented as a group of related words, like Irish, Ireland, tenant, landlord, owner. And that's where you can start figuring out what these texts are talking about. And here they've been plotted over a timeline to sort of see, notice a shift in topics. So um, what does it look like? It mostly looks like code. Uh, most of the times, if you want to do this work uh, at a level that really gives you good results, you will have to start coding. Um, and I'm not an expert in this, so that's all I can say, really. Uh, um, the other thing I'm going to show, though, is uh, the fact that you know, these libraries, especially the ones that you can kind of use out of the box, 
uh, the, you know, they come with an API that allows you to, you know, build graphical interfaces that, uh, that will be able to work with that API. And this is essentially what these Voyant Tools uh, website um, does. Um, so you can give it a text or, you know, even a fairly large quantity of text and it will just, you know, run all of these algorithms for you and show you the results. So it's kind of fun to play around with, especially if, you know, you don't really want to get into coding, you just want to try and play around with the text that you have. So with some of my students, we're working now on a, a travel journal from the 17th century written by a French um, essentially a spy more than an explorer that went to uh, Buenos Aires and then sort of followed the river up to um, Potosí where the Spanish were mining a lot of silver. Uh, and let's see, hopefully I have it open. I forgot to open it. Let's see if I uh, just get it from here. Um, so uh, I think this link that I'm following, if my computer doesn't get too slow, automatically loads these text, which is, you know, the, uh, book sized. So it's not particularly big, but it's large enough to already give us um, some interesting insights. Um, when I'm using Zoom, uh, things just get too slow. So I might just show you the, the screen, uh, the screenshot here in the interest of time. Um, but essentially we'll build something like a word cloud, uh, which uh, Jordan show, uh, showed in one of his slides, uh, you know, and based on frequency, they will be larger. And you can tell that these tools, at least out of the box, do not understand uh, Spanish very well because typically uh, you know, grammatical words tend to be uh, uh, removed uh, because they're used a lot. And, you know, a means at or towards. Um, so uh, that, you know, that sort of skews the results, right? It's one of those words you want to remove so that you get to the meat a little bit faster. And then, you know, here you get graphs based on sort of frequency of words and where they occur in document segments. So it sort of breaks down the document so that you can have, see it in a, in a sequence a little bit more. You can probably set some parameters to control how that works. And if I were able to click on a single word here, uh, this will change to show me information specific to that word. And here on the bottom right, you can see what's called a co-occurrence. So you look at a word and it shows you what frequently comes uh, like before and after it, uh, which can give you some insights specifically, I don't know if it's the name of someone, you can maybe get a sense of how they're talked about. Yeah. Bit of a insight into, into your text. Um, and this is just the surface. If you then start using these tools programmatically, there's a lot more that you can infer. Uh, and if you then want to build a visualization out of it, I already mentioned that uh, many text analysis code libraries will already come with their own visualization functions. Uh, one uh, programming language that is used a lot for this work, it's uh, called R, like the letter R. Um, uh, which also has powerful visualization libraries, um, or you can make your own. And one of my sort of favorite tools is called D3, uh, which is a JavaScript library. So it targets um, for the most part, the web uh, and the browser. Uh, it's very versatile and it's widely adopted for digital journalism. So if you looked at uh, all those um, election updates obsessively the past week, a lot of them were built using this technology. Okay, um, we only have 10 minutes left more or less, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, another thing that uh, is essential to work with in digital humanities is um, uh, geography and sort of um, sp space and place. Uh, when we are, whether we are working with historical material or present one, you know, it tends to be situated uh, somewhere. Um, and there's a lot that we can say about um, uh, the world and how it's connected to the cultural objects that we study. Um, so um, a typical uh, way of doing this in the digital humanities is to, you know, plot things on maps um, uh, and in a, often in an interactive way so that you can uh, use maps as a way of um, showing your scholarship, as a way of storytelling, as a way of teaching uh, your findings to others. And this is done relying on geographical coordinates 
to attach information to a specific place. Uh, and uh, this is not a technology that is being developed by the digital humanities. This is very much, this very much comes from the sciences. It's called geographic information systems and it's widely used across disciplines, really social sciences, um, you know, meteorology, but also the humanities. Uh, and typically this information will be stored as uh, structured or even more often a semi-structured data, uh, like in XML formats or um, JSON formats, um, that is sort of a similar um, idea to XML. Um, and then it gets processed via code or with GIS tools so that you can create visualizations such as this one here. This is a project called Torn Apart or uh, Separados which uh, maps ICE facilities uh, in US and provides a lot of context and access information. Uh, it's really fun to explore actually, because it really, uh, it's been around for a few years now and, and really sort of calls out, you know, uh, people as you click on this, you will see like which politician funded it and, and all of that. It's a way of doing really sort of um, activist humanities research here. Uh, but you know, very popular use is to uh, is to work with historical data uh, and plot it. So here, for example, in Digital Harlem, uh, it, this is relying on a Google Maps application, um, which allows you to like program it to add extra layer information on top of it. So they actually took old maps uh, from 1920, 1925, 1930, so that you can get a sense of how the space has changed and who was there. So there's a very rich of information here uh, that tells the story of a specific place in the world. Um, Google Maps is not the only one that allows you to do this. You can do it with like Bing Maps and, and, and other ones. But if you really want to build your own with maximum flexibility, then uh, Leaflet uh, is one um, JavaScript library that uh, allows you that, that level of flexibility. And it's actually not all that hard to use. Um, another way of telling stories uh, through uh, geographical data is uh, using what's called a story map. Um, this is actually a product of uh, ArcGIS, which is an expensive professional software for doing, you know, usually like uh, um, sort of ur urban studies work and uh, urban planning even. Um, but you know, again, you can layer, but by layering more information on it, uh, you, there's a lot that you can show what happened in the past. So you can you know, uh, annotate the world um, that you see now. Uh, and with their story maps, it, you can actually build like a narrative through it and it gets presented as a web page. And as you scroll through, it will like move the map in different places um, so that you can, you know, show some uh, information um, that describes what you're seeing, right? It can become so like a, a little documentary that you go through um, by scrolling with your mouse. Um, right, I wanted to quickly show what it looks like to create something like this using Google. Uh, on, you, if you have Google Drive as uh, a, UM, a person at UMD, uh, you will be able to do this. You can create uh, your own map uh, and you can add uh, different kinds of things on, on the map, often just places or lines or areas with some basic information attached to it. And you can always export it using this KML format, uh, which then will allow you to import it into more professional software or you know, build um, an, another map with leaflet. You can get that data out. Uh, it just, it's just that the, the Google Maps doesn't really allow you to add a lot of information to it. Um, and you know, very briefly, I was gonna uh, sort of piggyback on uh, the work that one of my students did last year, Brittany Drake. She, for a final project, she collected information about uh, Google venues uh, around DC and she created a map um, with it. And you can see it, it's linked here once you get the slides. Um, there's a lot, a lot more information, but like some of these uh, locations are here. Uh, like one is in 7416 Baltimore Avenue. So if I, you know, working with my map, I can say 7416 Baltimore Avenue in College Park. It comes up, you know, I don't think it's a place that is open anymore, but I can then add it to my map. Right? And you can see how it gets like structured in a layer and you can add multiple layers, which allows you to 
to build different types of data that you want to put on a map, for example, uh, and you can add some information about it. Mostly it's just a free text, so you can't really structure it, but you know, uh, what they say it was called Paragon. So I don't know, I'm just gonna say like Paragon. And now I've added it to my map. Uh, and if I keep on going, I can structure this information here and it is uh, somewhat trivial to then like embed it in a website where I may be providing further context about this research that I did. And this just becomes an instrument to, pres to uh, present it. Um, okay, uh, another uh, type of work that, that, that can be done that is worth talking about is uh, linked open data. So we've seen what graph data looks like. Uh, but you can go beyond sort of uh, net, uh, network visualization and analysis because graphs are massively addressable. You can keep on adding things as long as, you know, there is like a, a URL for each of these nodes. Uh, you can then target the URL and say something more about it. The web itself is a graph because we can link all these different pages and the pages are the nodes, right? Um, and... Uh, this is based on, on this idea of a semantic triple where you have a subject, a predicate, and an object. Uh, for example, I can say College Park, which is the node, is located in Maryland. And then I can say more specifically about Maryland, more about College Park, but this triple uh, is giving me the, the piece of information of, uh, you know, uh, of College Park's location. And here, you know, it's not as explicit, but essentially what these uh, um, arcs mean is, uh, is connected to. Right, and then we are relying on thickness to express another uh, semantic triple that is like by this factor, right? And that, and that that's the thickness essentially. Um, but so if you start uh, providing uh, interesting predicates uh, and put them on the web, um, you can you start building what's called the semantic web, uh, and there are uh, sets of ontologies that you know, uh, suggest what kind of properties and what kind of arcs you may want to, um, to build. And then you can start uh, relying on uh, interesting aspects of the web to en enrich your publication and your collection of data. Um, so one useful thing in this world is gazetteers, which allow you to find reliable uh, pointers to known things. So VIAF is the international, virtual international authority file, which is, contains a lot of information in multiple languages about people and places, uh, in particular people. So this is the page for Frederick Douglass, and it comes with all sorts of variants that have been infirmed, inferred from exploring the web and so it gets collected here. So if you encounter any of these strings, you can go here and figure out which Frederick Douglass are we talking about. Um, and, and that comes with a, a, a permalink or sort of a URL or uh, that, that allows you to then link to this specific object. Uh, and you can also download all this information as a graph with you know, all the language information and all of that, but you can just treat this as a node as you're building your own um, collection, for example. And I don't have time to show you what that looks like. I'm just gonna point to uh, Rikukito, uh, which is a award-winning tool that allows you to you know, work with texts uh, and like, connect them, connect different parts of the text with existing uh, uh, ontologies and sort of um, authority files that exist on the web. So you can highlight something and connect it with uh, repositories so that you know exactly, you know, what Buenos Aires means here. There's a Buenos Aires in Mexico, for example, right? So I, by relying on something like Biaf, in this case, we're using geo names, um, you can indicate exactly which Buenos Aires are you talking about. Um, I'm going to skip, uh, well, just one minute on minimal computing. Uh, so all of everything that we've seen so far is uh, complex uh, and requires infrastructure, etc. And uh, we also talked about how uh, digital humanities projects require a lot of funding, etc. Uh, which makes, uh, you know, access to this kind of work a privilege. And uh, what if we start looking at doing digital humanities under constraints and said, what does it look like to do digital humanities where you do not have access to powerful hardware, to powerful software, to network capacity, uh, or you know, even you know, a voice? Um, and so 
this group from the global out to th has been coming up with you know a, let's say essentially a philosophy on on, on how to uh, you know bring these kind of questions to the fore uh, as well as a number of uh, potential solutions uh, including you know creating alternatives to something like Omeka um, that instead of having to rely on a large database and having to be hosted um, and maintained on expensive servers, you know, something that you can more easily bring up and maybe it's not as fully featured, but will still allow you to build a collection of items that then you can put even on a pen drive and be able to give it to someone or on the web. Uh, but, you know, through like free hosting services, for example. So rethinking the age from that perspective. Um, there is a lot more that you can uh, learn, and this was a very partial view, and there are a number of DH courses on campus. Uh, I encourage you to have a look as a humanist what's in your college, because there are a few that I may not even know about. Uh, but what I know about is what we offer at MITH, the Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities. Um, I'm now teaching MITH 301, which, is, which focuses on digital publishing and, and um, scholarly editions, but using minimal computing. And this is a global classroom, so uh, it's done in collaboration with students uh, from Argentina. Uh, we also offer an independent research study, uh, MIF388. You can take it as one, two, or three credit course. Uh, and it's, we help you like design your own TH project, and we work with you to bring it, you know, to, to complete it. And MIF735 is a graduate course called Anatomy of DH Research. Uh, where we go through the kind of methodologies, just similar to what I've done here, but, you know, over an entire course. I used to uh, teach this with a colleague, but now I'm too busy with Myth 301, so I'm not teaching it right now, but others are. Uh, and there's also a graduate certificate, uh, the Digital um, Studies in Arts and Humanities. Um, but there's also a lot that you can learn on your own. Uh, Programming Historian is a great resource uh, with uh, entry-level tutorials for all of these kind of methodologies. But also have a look at uh, the offering from UMD uh, on LinkedIn courses, where you can find a LinkedIn Learning, where you can find courses on Python, R, website building, data analysis. Now that you know which methodologies are useful, uh, you don't have to necessarily start from digital humanities. You can start from the methodology, right? Uh, learn it, and then you can bring it to, to your own work. And we're over time, so I think we're going to stop here. Thank you for listening. Okay, great. Lindsay, you want to, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that was great. And I, I know that, that there is so much more to learn, but that was also very comprehensive, especially for somebody like me who is a beginner in this area. I, I had a quick question. Uh, you mentioned at one point about um, how some of the text analysis tools aren't well suited to, in that example, Spanish, wasn't able to pick on, up on um, the use of ah as like an article. And so I wondered if that's something common that you see across uh, some of these tools that they are primarily set up for English. And if there are languages that um, were on adapting tools to, to be more responsive to them? Um, well, that sort of definitely used to be the case. Uh, that is changing. Um, you know, it, it, the easiest language is uh, to find support for it and to be uh, in English and German um, and French to some extent. Uh, but, you know, uh, in a way, like Google itself really sort of uh, brought forth a lot of innovation around sort of a language support. Um, and uh, you can now work with m most languages. Uh, the, that work is never done, um, but at this point it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier. So, uh, um, let me quickly uh, with uh, Recogito. So here, for example, I have um, that text from, um, uh, the explorer, the 17th century explorer, um, in English and in, uh, Span in, and in Spanish. Um, the date is later because of uh, I'm using a later edition. But so if I look at the Spanish text, um, sorry, actually both in Spanish, but I can say, so uh, Recogito comes with a named entity recognition system, which uses uh, natural language processing to try and determine what words are proper nouns. Uh, mm -hmm. and whether they are places or people. Um, so when you do this, you can use a number of um, uh, open source 
um, uh, recognition engines. Uh, and you know the people who created Rikukido work with uh, um, Greek and Latin a lot. So you know uh, the default one is Greek, for example. But you know the Stan Stanford Core and NLP uh, comes with at least four languages. So because this stack specifically is in Spanish, I can tell it to use that engine, um, and uh, it will then you know run the algorithms behind the scenes and attempt to identify. Um, places and people at the very least. Um, if that's taking too long, I can open one that I already... Um... And while that's opening, I'll just say, um, Peter... Okay, but you get the idea. Um, Peter, no worries about not having a camera or mic. It's hard. <laughs> Did you have any questions, uh, Peter, that you wanted to put in the chat from Dina today? Oh, okay, yeah. I see. And he makes a note about how it can be difficult to talk into the void. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But th thank you for coming, Peter. So, yeah, thank you. Primarily for um, languages that use the Latin alphabet, or have are there um, ways to do it for like Cyrillic or Kanji or anything? Yeah, uh, there are. Uh, definitely uh, tools for that um, as well. Yes, uh, you just need to know where to to find them. The uh, I don't know enough about text analysis to um, answer that with confidence. But for example, I know that for uh, optical character recognition (OCR), um, there are now a number of like which relies a lot more on machine learning to really function uh, at a high level. There are uh, models for you know languages like um, there's a big project working on Arabic right now. Um, Arabic script, uh, which has you know different languages, including like Farsi and you know classic Arabic, etc. Um, but yeah, um, I think where big issues are really uh, is with uh, languages that are not necessarily written uh, like left to right or even right to left. Um, so it's when we start getting into languages that already have very little representation that things get more complicated. Yeah, that's really like interesting. Sorry, and that speaks a little bit to some of the crowdsourcing issues too. There was a talk at MIF uh, last year. Um, the researcher I'm forgetting now, but he was working in, he was doing some transcription of um, Hebrew manuscripts. Um, and that was one of the issues that they had was that there wasn't a reliable uh, dictionary and there wasn't a, for multiple reasons, because in manuscripts, there's a lot of abbreviations and things like this. So coming up with, um, you know, a reliable set. And Cyrillic was one of the uh, characters that he was talking about too, that like with Cyrillic, Hebrew has a lot of issues with um, a digital format, especially when we're working across um, centuries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As soon as you add a sort of temporary dimension, then, you know, things get, get more complicated mm. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. That was great. <laughs>